and connecting with the delta function uh, matching. And for the 2D square well, we found that um, the cotangent of the phase shift was equal to some messy formula involving Bessel functions. And when we expand it for a uh, small k, we end up with uh, 2 over pi times uh, j0 of alpha over alpha j1 of alpha plus log of k times the width delta over 2 plus the <coughs> Euler constant. And then there were four k squared corrections, k squared times delta squared. And we noticed there was a uh, unusual thing happening here with the log. There was a special place where the phase shift vanished, uh, which uh, where the uh, where the cotangent of the phase shift vanished, which um, actually corresponds to a bound state, and that occurs at a very special value of k, which is which I call lambda, which. Uh, was interesting because it was exponentially related to the fundamental length scale. It's lambda is a mass scale, and it was related by e to the minus j zero of alpha over alpha j one of alpha times a uninteresting factor e to the minus the Euler constant. And this quantity up here went uh, one over alpha squared for small alpha. So this means that that exponent was huge. Um, and then I wanted to match this onto a Schrodinger equation with a delta function. And the question is, can we find a G coupling constant that uh, will reproduce this um, same sort of scattering at low k? And the first thing I pointed out was that this, this uh, Schrodinger equation had this funny property, which is that if you find a solution for this, for this equation, then I can find a rescaled solution, which is stretched or shrunk, which continuously changes the energy. So in particular, that if you find a solution psi of r, then I can define a psi lambda of r, which is equal to your solution, uh, evaluate not <coughs> lambda, but lambda r, and this thing has an energy e lambda which is equal to lambda squared e. And so if there's there's no distinct state here. There's no discrete spectrum. So this is like what happens in a conformal field theory. There aren't any particles in conformal field theory. There's just mush, OK? And this is a theory that has just mush. And it's, it um, is disturbing mush if, if there is any solution with a negative energy, because then there's no ground state. So this tells you that. The, although not as dangerous, perhaps, as the delta function of three dimensions, this, too, is a very singular uh, potential. So the next step was going to uh, redo what we did in three dimensions, which was to uh, calculate the amplitude uh, by summing up these bubble diagrams. <coughs> possible numbers of bubbles. And when you sum all these up, let me just do this right, you have this plus this plus this. And you find that the, uh, that the amplitude, um, OK, so let me first write down again what the Lagrangian was for this. The Lagrangian uh, looks like uh, uh, psi dagger i dt plus del squared over 2 big M, where big M is going to be uh, twice little m, because here we're talking about two particles, so little m would be the reduced mass. Um, on psi uh, minus uh, c0 over 4 <coughs> psi dagger psi squared. But it turns out that I'm going to have to uh, <coughs> deal with infinities again. And last time with the three dimensions, I used the momentum cutoff. And I did that for a reason. I, I wanted to show you that because of the linear divergence, I had to fine tune the coupling constant against this, this thing that was order lambda. <coughs> and the reason, and you can't see linear divergences in dimensional regularization, so that's why I didn't use DIMREG. But today, everything's going to be logs, and DIMREG is built to see logs. I'm going to use dimensional regularization here. Now, to use dimensional regularization, when you go to different dimensions, you want to keep your, your coupling constant the same dimension in, as you vary the space-time dimensions. And to do that, you have to put in a compensating factor of a mass scale, and that's where the renormalization scale sneaks in 
And uh, so the correct factor here, and this was uh, one of the problems for this section, is a factor of mu to the, okay, so I'm going to work in d space-time dimensions. And so let's <coughs> say I'm in two spatial dimensions. So I want to go to d equals 3, which is two spatial dimensions. And the correct factor here turns out to be d minus 3. It goes away when d equals 3. And it gives you the right factor. And yeah, why it's d minus 3 and not mu squared to the d minus 3 or something like that is what the problem is that you have to work out. So it's, uh, I'll turn off the side so it's more room. Now, when I sum up these bubbles, uh, with the same Feynman rules I had for the 3D case, uh, I'm doing it in arbitrary dimensions. So what I find, I'll find then is that the amplitude, just as I did last time, this is a geometric series, I'll get minus 1 over C0 uh, plus B. And B is this integral um, uh, mu to the uh, 3 minus, uh, mu minus, uh, three minus D. There may be a typo here. I don't remember if it's 3 minus D or D minus 3 here. I'm sorry. <coughs> Times, uh, uh, and then I'm going to do the Q0 integral like I did last time, picking out the poles. And you end up with a D minus 1 integral of the spatial momenta, the, the, the vector momenta as opposed to the energy, uh, of the same <coughs> integral that I saw last time. And you can see why I had to renormalize, because if I said d equals 3, which is where I want to be, then this is a d2q, and this is a 1 over q squared, and so I'm going to have a log divergence. So now I don't see the log divergence because I'm in d dimensions, so you use the usual uh, uh, dimensional regularization type uh, machinery, and uh, you get some gamma functions, and when you then take the limit to d minus 3, to d goes to 3, uh, you find that because you have a pole, 1 over d minus 3, and you got this mu to the 3 minus d, that you're left over with something that mu, the mu dependence doesn't go away, you get a log, and so when you expand around d equals 3, you get m over 2 pi, you get this pole, which represents the fact that this was a divergent integral at d equals 3, and then you get a finite part. <coughs> got, we have a pole, we have some finite numbers, logs of 4 pi, Euler constants, very familiar from dim reg in four dimensions. Then we get this log, which is k-dependent and mu-dependent, and then we get an imaginary part. An imaginary part, remember, always comes from the cut in the diagram, it's full of physics, you can't renormalize it away, it's supposed to be there, it's finite. Um, and we can't renormalize away the k-dependence because you can't uh, find a counter term that goes like log of a derivative that you can put in your Lagrangian. But the <coughs> constants and the pole are things that I can subtract off. Okay, and so when I stick this b into here, uh, what I end up getting then is that the um, the amplitude. Looks like uh, um, <coughs> this following quantity to minus one, um, and the quantity is minus one over keep going. <laughs> one over c zero plus this m over two pi times this pole one minus d minus one over d minus three plus m over four pi times d. <coughs> Pi, plus the log of a squared over mu squared, plus i pi. 
And so we use the <coughs> usual tricks, which is that I say, well, okay, this is the bare coupling, and I'm going to uh, define my renormalized coupling to subtract off all this stuff, leaving behind the log dependence and the imaginary part. So I'll redefine <coughs> all of this part up to there as minus 1 over C0 bar. And because there's a mu in the problem, I'm going to call this C0 bar mu. And then the last uh, manipulation which is uh, useful is to replace, <coughs> actually before I do that, sorry, it's useful to replace uh, uh, C0, define it to be G times 4 pi over M. And then the, four, the amplitude simplifies to get a 4 pi over M times minus 1 over G plus 2 over D minus 3. E log 4 pi plus log of k squared or mu squared plus m pi. Okay, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to redefine a renormalized G that soaks up this part. So that's my renormalized G. I'll put a bar over it. And because there's a mu here, I'm going to remind myself that I had a mu in the problem. I'll put G bar of mu. So now what I have is that the amplitude looks like 4 pi over m, 1 over uh, negative 1 over g bar of mu. This answer has to be mu independent. So really, at different values of mu, I should not be subtracting the same constant here. I should be also subtracting the log of mu 1 over mu 2. So the way to uh, say that is that I want this to be mu independent. So I say um, so I take I say that mu d by d mu of negative 1 over g of mu, g bar of mu, plus log k squared over mu squared <coughs> minus i pi should equal 0. Well, of course, the minus i pi doesn't do anything, and the log k squared get, gets killed by the d by d mu. If I define beta is defined to be mu d by d mu of g bar of mu, then this equation just says that beta over g bar squared minus 2, because mu d by d mu of log 1 over mu squared is minus 2, equals 0. Or in other words, that the beta function is just equal to twice g, g bar squared. So with this definition of the beta function, I'm, I arrive at the RG equation that uh, mu d by d mu of g bar mu is equal to g bar <coughs> So we see for this simple 2D problem, once you um, put in a delta function, uh, you start seeing all sorts of stuff that you're used to seeing in quantum field theory, which is Rg flow. <coughs> And in this case, either asymptotic freedom or asymptotically unfree theory, stuff that they don't ever mention in quantum mechanics, but they could. So let's look at that RG equation. And, uh, when you solve it, you find that uh, G bar mu is 1 over, well, you need a boundary condition, so I'm going to say that G, uh, G bar mu naught. <coughs> is defined to be g naught, And so when you solve this, you find that g bar mu is 1 over g naught plus twice log mu naught over mu. But 
what I'm interested in is the fact that uh, there's an intrinsic scale in this problem, which we found earlier in the square well, and that's the scale mu where this thing vanishes, or rather where g bar blows up. So we're going to find that scale of g bar of lambda equals infinity. This defines lambda So let's say that mu naught is that scale. Let's take mu naught equals lambda. So this one over g naught becomes zero. And I end up with g bar of mu is equal to one over uh, log of lambda squared over mu squared. So there's a special scale which I've put in there in place of this boundary value. So now instead of saying that some mu naught, there's some value of g, I'm going to say this theory has an intrinsic scale. It can be anything you want. That defines the theory. It's lambda. And then in all other mu's, this is what the running coupling is. OK, so now you go back to your amplitude here. And you say, okay, let's put in, let's, for convenience sake, let's put in mu equals lambda. Then this 1 over g bar of mu goes away, because it's 1 over infinity. Okay? And we get that our amplitude is 4 pi over m, 1 over log k squared over lambda squared minus i pi. <coughs> Yeah. So I'm um, you know, thinking of something wrong, but I thought that you would want g bar to be zero because we want the lambda was at the point where there was no scattering happening, right? Where the cotangent of delta was zero. Um, cotangent delta is not zero at delta equals zero. Oh yes. The delta equals zero, cotangent goes to infinity. So it's actually <coughs> cotangent delta equals zero that corresponds to um, uh, delta equals pi over two. So that that is where the bounce statement occurs. Good question. <coughs> well, you can then match this theory. You, you can show that this is equivalent to saying that cotangent delta is equal to negative 1 over pi log k squared over lambda squared. This is not equivalent to cotangent delta you found in the full theory. However, it is equivalent to cotangent delta in the low k expansion. <laughs> So long as you equate this lambda with the same lambda I found in the square well problem, which, uh, which is uh, 2 over delta e to the minus gamma e e to the minus j0 of alpha over alpha j1 of alpha, very nonlinear dependence on alpha in the square well problem. If you equate this lambda to this interesting function of alpha, you in fact do reproduce the low interest scattering of the square well. So we have an effective theory, it reproduces the low energy behavior, and it, uh, it makes very clear this, this interesting, uh, what this interesting scale is. It looks just like lambda QCD in, uh, in quantum field theory, except you, if you look at this carefully, you see that there's a difference between, uh, if you look at this flow, this is the beta function, looks like a parabola. Okay, and when it's positive, that means that as you increase mu, g is growing, which is the, usually what you do is you're interested in what happens when you lower mu. So when you, if g is positive and you reduce mu, you go to lower scale, you flow to zero. But if you're on the other side, negative, you flow up. Okay, so what's going on here is that if you started off with a repulsive interaction, g positive, you actually flow to zero coupling in the infrared, it's trivial, it's like QED. But if you start off with an attractive coupling, which is you start on this side, it flows off the infrared <coughs> coupling, which looks like QCD. <coughs> Unlike QCD, this is not a perturbative calculation, and you could actually go to scales below lambda. The theory is still correct. You go through a bounce state, your phase shift changes suddenly, and you can study the theory below the bounce state, which you can't do in QCD, because you only can study the beta function perturbatively in the coupling. 
So if you're on this side, then this, the meaning of the lambda is very different. Lambda now, that would correspond to the same formula here, but um, with alpha negative, a repulsive square well. It turns out that this now becomes a positive exponent. And so lambda, instead of being a much lower scale than one over delta, is at a much higher scale. This is called the Landau pole. And this really bothered people in, well, Landau, uh, in QED, because it suggests that when you go to a uh, very short distance, uh, Q QED seems to break down. Now, you can't tell, because in QED, you're doing perturbation theory. So maybe the coupling gets strong, and all sorts of interesting physics happens <laughs> in, the, in the UV, although now, with lattice studies, they don't think that's true. They think it's just a sick. So it looks like you get to a sick theory in the ultraviolet, but in the effective theory, you never get to do that because you can never scale up to uh, a mass scale which is much bigger than one over delta because your effective theory is broken down. We're, we're only looking at the low k limit of the original problem. So the Landau pole in this effective theory is fake. It occurs above the point where the effective theory has broken down. So similarly, we're not bothered by the Landau pole so much in QED because we know there's other stuff out there. Okay. Maybe this grand unification, maybe it goes into the non-abelian gauge theory. So the coupling grows up to the gut scale, and then it gets incorporated into some asymptotically free theory. Or maybe uh, even without grand unification, the Landau pole is above the Planck scale, so maybe quantum gravity kicks in. Okay? So our effective theory isn't good up to the Landau pole, so we are not too worried about the scale. Mm -hmm. People were thinking a lot about this in the context of the Higgs, though, because the five-fourth theory also has a Landau pole. And if the Higgs had been very heavy, lambda, the 5 fourth coupling, would have been big down at the weak scale, and you would hit the lambda pole at a very low energy. Maybe, uh, and so people were asking, how heavy could the Higgs be before the Higgs mass was near the lambda pole, in which case the theory would break down right away, and you'd need new <coughs> physics. And so people spent a lot of energy talking about how heavy the Higgs could be, and it was very interesting, but it doesn't seem to be relevant to uh, physics, since the Higgs seems to be much lighter. Uh, the, the limit was typically around 800 MeV or something like that. So what did we learn? So from the quantum mechanics examples, we've learned that, uh, that uh, you can reproduce low energy physics with contact interactions. We've learned that the higher you go in dimension, the more irrelevant short distance interactions are. At the same time, the more singular the delta functions are. So you start getting into the fact that it's irrelevant and requires renormalization. So that seems to be almost a contradiction, that renormalization says it's very important because you get infinities, but in fact, the answer is no. It does not affect low energy physics as much. So that's a strange thing. And then finally, uh, we found this very interesting theory where the interaction was marginal. Uh, it neither was irrelevant or relevant. It was scale invariant at the classical level, and then quantum effects kick it in one direction or the other. It's either slightly relevant or slightly irrelevant, where the word slightly means that you have to go to exponential scales before you start seeing a big effect. So these are all properties that you find in the field theory. So now I'm going to switch to four-dimensional quantum field theories. Any, if there are any last questions here? So a key part of, of understanding uh, how important things are in a quantum field theory is dimensional analysis. And so we start off from the fact that the, uh, we know we're doing a path integral over fields of e to the minus the action over h bar, and we're setting h bar to 1, so the action had better be dimensionless in those units because we're exponentiating it. So I'm going to write that as the dimension of the action is 0, but we write the action as uh, it's integral over space-time, and then we have some sort of Lagrangian. And so, for example, the prototype Lagrangian I'm going to talk about is a scalar field theory for a moment. So there's a kinetic term, there's a mass term, there's a by fourth term. But I want to keep going, so I'm going to put a whole bunch of irrelevant operators in. I'll show, I'm going <coughs> to... Okay, so I'm going to want to define this with a cutoff lambda. And I'm going to write the coefficients of my operators in terms of this lambda, but it's still going to be completely arbitrary because I'm going to put arbitrary couplings in it. So I'm going to look at a whole bunch of things which involve uh, powers of phi. So 
4 plus 2n. So now I've got it. I've gone up to phi fourth, and here's a whole bunch of going phi sixth, phi eighth, phi tenth. I'm looking at a theory of the phi goes to minus phi symmetry, so I don't have to look at odd powers of phi. I can also add things with uh, two derivatives. So I'll look at a bunch of operators that uh, look like d phi squared, phi to the 2 plus 2n. So, uh, Right, so I'm starting off at, uh, I don't know why I'm starting off at this end. Anyway, here's a whole bunch of operators with two derivatives and a bunch of phi's and so on. Um, I think the dimensions are, don't make sense here. Hang on a second. I think I just want a 2n there. Yeah. The n starts at uh, 1, so uh, the first term looks like a kinetic term with an extra phi squared. So that, that's the typo in the notes. There should just be a 2n. So, um, looking at that theory, and uh, I put that lambda in for convenience, but I'm also going to specify that these couplings are not totally arbitrary. I'm going to want to talk about a theory where um, that I'm going to take my CN and DN to be much less than one, so I can talk about perturbation theory in those couplings. Yeah. Uh, how come every n doesn't get its own lambda? It's on what? Lambda. So like phi to the six coupling can have a different uh, scale than phi to the eight. Well, that's that's in here. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Because that's why I said this is perfectly general. Okay. Uh, there's a reason why I'm doing this. I'll explain it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to assume that these couplings are not big. Uh, also, lambda not big. And I'm also going to assume that uh, for now that uh, um, that I'm looking at a relativistic theory. But one where the moment is much less than this cutoff lambda. <laughs> now, then what I do is I assign a scaling dimension, a mass dimension, where I define uh, x to have dimension minus 1 and p to have dimension plus 1. I know that they have to have opposite dimensions because of the uncertainty principle says that the commutator of x with p equals h bar, which I'm setting to 1. And if I do that, then, you know, I immediately see that if this is dimension, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to work in four dimensions, so that's four. This is dimension four, uh, minus four, and then D has dimension <coughs> plus one, so this is plus two. Uh, and then I must have another plus two to cancel this minus four. And so I immediately discover that phi plus dimension one. And then if you look at how I uh, normalize things, unless I made a mistake there, it should be that all the CNs and the DNs and the lambda of dimension zero. Okay, and so um, what we're gonna find then is that uh, these guys here, all the things that have inverse powers of lambda are gonna be irrelevant and going to be very singular, require we normal, uh, have extra problems with renormalization. This one to be, and this one are marginal, and this one with the positive mass dimension in front of it is going to be relevant. And I'll show you that. Uh, you don't have to accept it, but, but I do want to mention um, that there's something that's always bothered me by this um, analysis is that you see it's completely dependent on the fact that I put coupling constants in front of everything except for the kinetic term. I started off the kinetic term to define phi. Why didn't I start off by just putting in a phi to the 6 coupling and say we're going to normalize our theory so that the coefficient <coughs> of phi to the 6 is 1. Then I'd immediately determine that the dimension of phi is 2 thirds. I think. Okay? And then I'd get completely different scaling arguments. So why did I do that? So it's important to understand why the kinetic term is special. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, ask, what are the field configurations that contribute most to this path integral? And the problem, though, is a path integral is a really huge thing to think about because field space is so big. So I'm going to restrict myself to a very specific field configuration. I'm going to look at something I'm going to call phi k, which is <coughs> sort of like a, what you call a wavelet. 
this is a little blip and field like this, uh, where this size, this is uh, x, this size is 2 pi over k. That's, and so this is a field configuration that has wave number of <coughs> roughly k. It's not a plane wave, but it's roughly k. And it lives in a volume that's roughly 2 pi over k to the fourth. And so the point of doing this is that if I take dx of phi k, this is about equal to k phi k, and if I do an integral d4x over some function of phi k, this is about equal to 2 pi over k to the fourth times f of phi k, because phi only has support in the box of size 2 pi over k. But the one thing I'm not going to fix here is the amplitude, which is, I'm going to call that phi k. So this is phi of x. And the amplitude is going to be called phi k. So I'm going to turn this path integral into an ordinary integral, where I take this field configuration, and instead of integrating over all fields, I'm going to do an ordinary integral over the amplitude. And then I ask them, what parts of this action are the most important? Which, what are the things that are going to cut off this path integral? And I should have uh, told you, uh, I've talked to lattice people too, many, too much, I forget to mention, why don't I have an I in there? Okay, because I've rotated to Euclidean space time. That's where the path integral is well defined. So instead of talking about phases canceling with each other, I have this pure exponential thing with no i. And then it's very easy to say where the path integral stops being important. That's where the action gets bigger than one. <coughs> so let me stick in this funny field and replace the path integral with an ordinary integral. Ah. Um. I'm sure it was supposed to be like that. So when I stick that, uh, that uh, particular field in, what I find then is that this, this up in E here reminds me of Euclidean action. Okay, this <clears throat> the spatial integral over my Lagrange bulk part of uh, my Lagrange density gives me uh, 2 pi over k to the fourth. This comes from my integral d4x. And then I have a very simple task. I just have a uh, one half k squared by k squared, and then I have my mass term. I'm not going to worry about the signs. They're not going to matter. It's, they're all, everything comes in positive when you, uh, when you do work in Euclidean space time. OK, there's, uh, there's that. There's lambda over 4 factorial by k squared. There's the sum on n, uh, cn over lambda to the 2n by k to the 2m plus 4. Uh, 2 and plus 2. Yeah. Well, I guess I was summing from n equals 0. That was my off. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm summing, summing from n equals 1 to infinity uh, dn over lambda to the 2n k squared phi to the uh, 2n and so on. I could have added more operators, but this is where I'm going to stop. Why do you not have a for the quadratic term is just phi k squared? Sorry? A for the quadratic term is just phi k squared? Shouldn't this be? Yeah, fourth. Thank you. And also the second in the next term? Sorry, what? Also in the next term, you have a, shouldn't it be 2n plus 4? Plus 4. Well, OK, so I was getting confused about whether I was summing from n equals 0 or from n equals 1. Okay. I want to start off at, at uh, oh, you're right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Right. I had it right. Good. Thanks. Now, the last thing I want to do to uh, manipulate this is I want to define uh, phi k uh, hat equals phi k over k. So notice the first term looks like phi k squared times k squared divided by k to the fourth. So now I get that there's just a 2 pi to the fourth out in front. And then the kinetic term just becomes a phi k hat squared. The mass term becomes an m squared over k squared, phi k hat squared. The phi fourth term has no um, 
k is in it because I had a 5 to the 4th over k to the 4th. And then, <coughs> for all these other terms, um, since there's no k's out in front and phi hat is dimensionless, you just get all of the numbers right by making sure that the k's are paired up with the lambdas. So I get a cn k over lambda to the uh, 2n times phi k hat to the 2n plus 4 plus dn a over lambda to the 2n by a hat to the 2n plus 2, and so on. OK, so <clears throat> here is what the action is. It's now written in a pretty simple form in terms of this phi k hat. And my path integral then is going to just be, ah, sorry, I think that's where I won't find this. So the path integral now just becomes an ordinary integral over dk phi hat uh, e to the minus s, and that's s. Now, this thing gets contributions all the way up to the point where s equals order 1. And you can ask yourself, which of these terms brings s up to order 1 first? <clears throat> well, so this goes like phi k hat squared. So this will be order 1 when phi k hat looks like 1 over 4 pi squared. This also has phi k hat squared. But it's preceded by an m squared over k squared. And I said, I'm interested in a relativistic theory where m squared over k squared is much less than 1. And therefore, this is less important than that. Phi k to the fourth, well, I told you that lambda was less than 1. So this is unimportant. When this term is order 1, this is still small. In fact, it's not just small because lambda is less than 1. In fact, you could have said that lambda would have to be less than mm -hmm. some 4 pi squared. It's only when lambda gets on the order of 4 pi squared or something like that. I, I don't know the powers exactly before this becomes of the same order as that because of this overall factor. So as you go down, you see each one of them, uh, for k much less than lambda, these get less and less important. And so your path interval is completely, the, the size of the fluctuations are completely determined by the kinetic term. And all the other <coughs> terms are less important. All bets are off if you go to a theory where these couplings are strong. okay. So if I write down an irrelevant operator, but I make its dimensionless coupling when I've scaled up the lambdas to be big, then everything changes. okay. And I don't know how it changes. It gets complicated. <laughs> okay. Another way it can change is to go to the <coughs> non-relativistic limit, where m is bigger than k. All of a sudden, the mass term dominates, and I have to change my scaling properties. Then I really should say that the mass term is normalized to 1, and the kinetic term becomes irrelevant. Okay, So the, the scaling properties of non-relativistic theories change. But for relativistic theory, this justifies why we do the dimension counting we do, and why these higher dimension operators are really unimportant. Now, <coughs> in the bad old days, when they saw something like the Fermi theory, they didn't think of the theory as having a cutoff. Or if they did, they thought of trying taking this cutoff to infinity. So imagine what would happen if I took my um, phi to the sixth term, <coughs> and I said, I'm going to put a 1 over mw to the fourth. Well, I'm going to put a g family in front of it. OK? Well, I can write this. You know, I told you I want to put a 1 over lambda squared here. So I'm going to put a 1 over lambda squared here and a lambda squared here. So this is my way of writing the theory. And now they want to take lambda to infinity while they're keeping g Fermi, the physical value. So this is what we would have called uh, C1. Okay. So what's happening to C1 is it's going to be it's getting infinitely large. Okay. And so if you think of it in this language as saying that I want to fix a g Fermi here, but I want to take my cutoff to infinity, this this operator becomes super strongly coupled, and I don't know how to deal with the theory. Because it completely changes how the path angle works. The connect term is by far the least important term, and this term is the most important. So that's why when you don't, when you are fixated on removing your cutoff from your theory, you get extremely confused by irrelevant operators because they all look strongly coupled. 
And that's what Wilson changed. He said, don't try to take the cutoff and fit it. Okay. <coughs> what happens is when you get to the cutoff, you have to find a new description for your physics to go on. In this case, the standard model. <coughs> Okay, so how does one use an effective field theory? This is all very, uh, very uh, formal. Um, so a lot of it is dimensional analysis. Now that we've seen how scaling works, uh, we should find that when we look at the uh, low energy properties of, say, the Fermi interaction, uh, we should find that it's a very small effect. And that's, in fact, what we will find, and that's why it's called the weak interactions. Even though at high energy, they're not especially weak. Um, there are two uses, there are three uses of effective field theory. There's the top down, where you know the UV theory. Let's say in this case, we now know the standard model. We can say the standard model is a beautiful theory, but it's way too complicated for doing something simple like neutron decay. So let's write down an effective theory where we match to a low energy theory of the Fermi interaction, and let's compute what G Fermi is from the standard model and use that to compute mm -hmm. neutron decay. And it makes life a lot easier, okay, or muon decay. That's the top-down theory. I'll give a couple examples of that. Then there's the bottom-up way of doing it, which is to say, we've got the standard model. We're interested in looking for new physics. So we're going to ask, what are the irrelevant operators I can write down that are consistent with the standard model? What effects do they predict? Let's look for them. If we find them, maybe we can get a clue on how to build the next step of the theory up beyond the standard model. So that's the bottom-up use. And the third one is for philosophical musings about the human condition and fine-tuning. And we'll talk about that also. So for the top-down example, I'll uh, talk about how we now would do Fermi theory. Fermi, of course, did it as a bottom-up theory. We'll do it as top-down. So actually, um, <laughs> Okay, so uh, I'm going to do this really briefly. It's in more detail in the notes because this is probably something that most of you are familiar with. Um, the uh, in the standard model, if you look at uh, the coupling of the of the uh, W and Z, you have uh, E over sine theta W times W mu plus J mu plus <coughs> Uh, minus plus W U minus J U plus. Now I'll write down what these currents are in a moment. Uh, plus E over uh, sine theta weak cos theta weak <coughs> Z mu J mu three minus sine squared theta J mu plus or minus. Okay, so you've probably seen this before because you've seen the standard model. I write down in my notes what these currents are. They're made out of quarks and leptons. I'm not going to write it down <coughs> now just to save a little bit of time of writing. They're the left-handed currents for the uh, W, and there's a left-handed current here and the electromagnetic current there. The important thing, though, is that uh, at if you want to know the low energy theory, at tree-level matching, what you do is you take the whole idea is you want your amplitudes to be the same in the full theory as they are in the effective theory. So the full theory at tree level, I'll have a tree level exchange of the W and Z, where this um, propagator is uh, minus I G mu nu over Q squared minus M of the W or Z squared. And if I'm interested in the low Q behavior, small momentum transfer, then I'm going to approximate this in a momentum expansion as minus i g mu nu over, I said plus i g mu nu over m squared. And so what I'm going to get then is I'm going to get these uh, e squared over sine squared w times uh, j mu plus j mu minus <coughs> times. Uh, this uh, 1 over mw squared plus 7 for the z. Okay, And so then what you do is you take this and you write it down in terms, you call that thing uh, up to factor <coughs> of 8 and rep 2, you call it g Fermi, and you've computed what g Fermi is in the low energy theory, and then you can use this four Fermion interaction to compute things like muon decay or neutron decay. It's pretty straightforward. 
Um, the reason why I didn't want to spend a lot of time on that is you've probably seen that. The important uh, implication, though, of this is that, for example, if you want to um, compute, say, some neutrino cross-section, whether it's neutral currents or charge currents, of course, you can get the beautiful cross-section from there. But the important thing is that your cross-section has to go like an amplitude squared. The amplitude has a G Fermi in it, which is that combination of the factors of eights and root twos because of funny normalizations that didn't know about the standard model. So when you take the amplitude squared, you can get a G Fermi squared. <coughs> but a cross-section is an area which has dimension <coughs> minus 2, but G Fermi has dimension 1 over mass squared, so G Fermi squared has dimension minus 4, so there's a mismatch. Of course, it's going to be cured by the phase space integral. Phase space integral, if you have light particles or relativistic particles, is just given by the energy, so you can get a factor of S up here. Of course, there are factors of 4 pi's and numbers, which I'm, I'm not writing down. But the important thing is that there has to be a, a power of s in here to make the dimensions right. And the fact that it's s to a positive power is required because of the fact that G Fermi has inverse mass dimension, which is very much related to the fact that this is an irrelevant operator. So here you see where the irrelevancy comes in, which is that at small s, this cross-section vanishes. That's not true for electromagnetic scattering, which goes like, well, if you had massless, if you look at uh, scattering of electrons at energies above its mass, so you can ignore its mass by dimensions, the only thing you've got is S. Okay, so for E plus E minus, you get sigma goes like one over S, okay, which is the natural scale for a cross section. So in fact, this is two powers of S smaller than its natural size because of the G Fermi squared. So this is small at <coughs> and that's where we see the fact that it's irrelevant coming in. The complication of course is when we start talking about radio corrections to irrelevant operators that's going to be tomorrow's lecture. We'll talk about that. But for now tree level very clear and of course this was understood by Fermi. So um, in my lecture notes, I give another example, uh, which is a little bit more obscure, which is I asked, well, what is, suppose I wanted to look at the scattering of light off a neutral atom in the atmosphere. So this is neutral. You have a big heavy atom <coughs> and low energy light bounces off it. Okay, how does the cross section go with the energy of the light? So I discussed um, in the notes. I'm going to have to skip this because of time. But what I do is I show you how you write down the lowest dimension operator you can for light scattering off a neutral atom. It can't be through a covariant derivative because the atom is neutral. So it's got to be some higher dimension thing. And gauge invariance tells you it has to involve powers of f mu nu. So you're, you're sort of forced into a pretty high dimension <coughs> operator, forced into a dimension seven operator. <coughs> and you find that because of that, this cross section has to go like uh, some powers of energy. And you find it actually goes like energy to the fourth. So here is something where you show that the, the cross section vanishes like energy to the fourth, a low energy. And that has the <coughs> important implication that the bluer the light, the stronger the scattering. And so at a superficial level, that is why the sky is blue. So you find that Rayleigh scattering goes like the cross section goes like uh, R naught to the six, where R naught is the size of the atom, the Bohr radius basically, times energy of the photon <coughs> to the four. So dimension seven operator has to have a coefficient that goes like one over mass cubed, which in this case goes like R naught cubed. 
So when you square that, you get an R naught to the sixth. And so you get the Rayleigh scattering formula that the energy goes like, that the crossing goes like the energy to the fourth. So I'm sorry I'm having to skip stuff. I put too much stuff in my book for this because there's so much interesting stuff. So the last thing I want to mention today uh, uh, is the bottom up type of physics. In particular, how do we go beyond the standard model? And to understand um, how you even begin to think about this, uh, I don't want to just throw in random operators. Um, I want to understand uh, which ones might have an observable consequence. And to do that, it's interesting to ask uh, to understand the idea of accidental symmetry. So an accidental symmetry is a very key idea. We've learned about global symmetries, learned about gauge symmetries, learned about spontaneous breaking of symmetries, you've learned about explicit breaking of symmetries, you've learned about anomalous symmetries, okay? But actually, perhaps one of the most important ideas is an accidental symmetry. It's a symmetry that looks like a symmetry at low energy, but isn't a symmetry at all of the full theory, okay? And a, an example of this um, is very practical, is when, when uh, people do lattice QCD, they construct the world out as a, as a lattice of points in four dimensions. And they look at low uh, energy, long wavelength excitations. They say, this is going to be my prediction for what QCD in the real world looks like. <coughs> but you have to ask, you know, they butchered space time. They don't have Lorentz symmetry or the Euclidean version, which is SO4 symmetry. They have this lattice. It's got hypercubic symmetry. How come uh, they're not telling us, I mean, you think that they would tell us that when you scatter two protons, you get Bragg spots, OK? because space is a lattice. Why are they able to tell us what goes on in a Lorentz invariant world? And the answer is that you have an accidental Lorentz symmetry on the lattice, which is to say that uh, even though the fundamental theory that they've got on the lattice only has hypercubic symmetry, which is not SU4, SO4, there's only a subgroup very small subgroup of SO4. And this is the theory we want, the symmetry we want. That's the Euclidean version of the Lorentz symmetry. The point is that um, all operators that are hypercubic invariant but not SO4 invariant happen to be irrelevant. If you try to write down a lattice operator, which is consistent with the hypercubic symmetry, but which breaks Lorentz invariance, you can't do it with an operator that's dimension four or less. So for example, an operator I can write down, <coughs> given the fourth, it turns out the following operator is hypercubic invariant, psi bar, gamma mu, D mu cubed psi sum on mu is one to four. This is hypercubic invariant. It's invariant under all the rotations and reflections you can do on a lattice. Okay? It's obviously not Lorentz variant because it, it's like fingernails on chalk to even look at such a thing when you've got three things, four things with mu's on them. You know, we've learned from Einstein, you only have two things with mu's on because we've got Lorentz symmetry ingrained in us. This is an operator you could get on the lattice, but it's dimension six, and so when you go to the long wavelength limit, it goes away. It's not important. So they get an accidental Lorentz symmetry that comes out of the low energy limit. What are the accidental symmetries of the, of the standard model? Well, Big ones are B and L, baryon number and lepton number. You cannot write down a gauge invariant operator that violates baryon number in the standard model that has dimension less than six. The reason is because you need three quarks to make a color singlet, but you can't have uh, you can't stop there because three quarks is a fermion, so you have to have another fermion. So you have you're you're stuck with a minimum of four fermions. 
With lepton number, <coughs> it's more interesting. With lepton number, you can put in two lepton doublets and two Higgses. Okay? Since the Higgs is a scalar, this is not dimension six, this is dimension five. So you can add an operator that looks like this. This violates lepton number because I've got two L's, not an L and a E conjugate, not an L or an L dagger, just two L's. So this very violates lepton number by two. So I'm allowed to violate lepton number by adding stuff to the standard model. But because it's irrelevant, it will be a small effect of low energy. So you can ask yourself, maybe all these things we call symmetries of nature are just accidents, okay? And we just have to look for small effects and we'll see their violation. In this case, um, you automatically get a neutrino mass out of this when the Higgs gets a BEV. <coughs> it's the BEV of the Higgs squared over lambda. So let's say I, I put in lambda equals the Planck scale, and I put in the known Higgs BEV, I get, uh, and Planck is 1 times 7 to 19 BEV. <coughs> certainly, if this operator is going to be generated, certainly it should be generated by the Planck scale, at least, that this is uh, m nu equals 10 to the minus 5 dB. If I put in lambda equals 16 dB, I get m nu equals 10 to the minus 2 dB. So you see, this is very interesting. It's, these numbers are looking very similar to the types of numbers you see from neutrino mixing. So maybe it's not that. Uh, I mean, maybe we should have expected that uh, any, that there's got to be some, if there's high scale physics, you're automatically going to get neutrino masses out of this. Um, you can then, if you measure neutrino masses, then you, oh, so by the way, this is, incorporates the so-called seesaw mechanism. The seesaw mechanism, which says that you put in a heavy right-handed neutrino and you get a light left-handed neutrino, it's really just saying that heavy neutrino generates an irrelevant operator. An irrelevant operator is going to be a small effect, so your neutrino is going to be very light. It's going to go like inverse proportional to the U physics, which in this case is neutrino mass. You can ask how would this operator be generated, and you really are left with only two possibilities. You can have L his his L with a fermion that goes in between, which we'll call N, that's your right-handed neutrino scenario, or you can have L, L, a scalar goes across and H, H, and this is on phi field, and you can check that to make the quantum numbers work, it has to be a uh, SU2 triplet. So a heavy triplet scalar would also generate this, this term and also have the seesaw mechanism. So these are really the only two possibilities, and now you can start exploring model building. Is it easy to put in a right-headed neutrino? Yes, this is much more compelling because SO10 has them automatically. <coughs> Triple scalars, I don't know. doesn't look too compelling. Okay, so that's where I'm going to stop today. And then, uh, I'm sorry, I just skipped why the sky is blue. Uh, you can read it. Uh, and then uh, next time I'm going to finish this uh, beyond the standard model physics with proton decay and then move on to radio corrections. Okay, questions? You say maybe <coughs> all the symmetries of nature that we see may be accidental symmetries, but I mean, how can this be true for gauge symmetries? I don't think it can be. It, it cannot be. Cannot. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, gauge fact, I think there's a theorem by uh, Weinberg and Witten, uh, if I remember correctly, which is that you can't start with a UV theory that does not have a gauge symmetry, and then in the IR you do have a gauge symmetry. But gauge symmetries are funny because, you know, Seibert showed that there are theories that are equivalent to each other with different gauge groups. So a gauge symmetry is really a constraint, it turns out. Uh, like in, it's, you can think of it like in as QCD that you should have color neutral hadrons, for example. Uh, that's a constraint on the spectrum of the theory. And uh, remarkably enough, there are these balls where you can show explicitly that completely different gauge groups have the same IR physics. So gauge symmetries are... I don't, I don't really understand. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? All right, let's thank David again. So uh, our next <laughs> lecturer is from Gildad. He's going to continue his, um, his talk from yesterday.